was a church plant. I, I think we are no longer considered a church plant. We're, we're a bit too old for being called a church plant now. But we, we were a church plant. And, 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 and we've been involved in, 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 in helping a few churches get going. And there's opportunity for more of that to happen. The first uh, couple to ever host a, a God, God's tribe church meeting of any form uh, in their home is a, is a couple called uh, Kelvin and Belinda Massingham. They, they were instrumental in planting this church. And then God moved them on to Nairobi, and, and now they're part of our sister church, one tribe there, which is it's doing really well. Fantastic church. We, we had a couple here. We didn't get to know them really, really well, but they became friends, and they heard that we're interested in church planting. Um, Stuart and Michelle Ailing. Knew them for a short while. They had kids here as well. Um, they work for... MAF, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship, um, and then God, God moved them to Arusha, and when they moved to Arusha, they, they, they were like, I, I remember the, the, the night before we had the conversation with them, Trudy and I were talking at home saying, hey, um, man, we, we, we need to plant a church in Arusha. They're like, yeah, we, we do. That's our vision as a church. We want to be into planting churches. And then the next morning, we were still meeting at Mlimani City, uh, Michelle comes up to me and says, hey, I think God's tribe needs to plant a church in Arusha. They're like, yeah, we, we think that's true. Because that's the heart of God, is, to, is that His gospel expands, His gospel spreads as churches are planted. So they moved there a few years ago and met a few other families, and, 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 and there's Arusha House Church now in Arusha that we have a relationship with. Out of that... And, and we're trusting God for, for more of that. If you just think of Dar es Salaam, for example, there is opportunity for so many more churches to be planted. They don't have to look exactly like this. You know, nice building and I mean, this is great, but church is the people, right? And it's Christ in them that, that lives through them. It's the power of the Spirit working in them. There's an opportunity in our city to have more churches planted. But we also want to be into the business of strengthening churches because churches um, are living. They're alive. And, 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 and anything that's living can be healthy or unhealthy. So we're hoping that God would use us to come alongside other churches and and. And they would be like, hey, listen, we, we think you can help us. I had a conversation just about two weeks ago with someone who said, look, we've been looking at Advance. Advance is the family of churches that we are part of. And, and you know, we're part of a big family, churches across the world. And, 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 and he said, he's part of a church here in the city. And he said, look, maybe, maybe you guys can help us to become more of, you know, of what a church could be. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I, I my, my mind is more in holiday mode, but man, if, 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 if you want to talk about church strengthening and church partnership, I'm certainly up for that. And, and I'm looking forward to conversations around that, see where God takes that. It might go somewhere, it might not go anywhere, but it's certainly in the realm of our vision, what we want to be as a church. Planting churches, strengthening churches, and then there's this thing of transformation, that the gospel is not just good information, the gospel actually changes lives. The Holy Spirit actually works in people to, to make them different from what they were, and, and we want to be a community where there is change, where People are being transformed where you can say, you know, I, I used to be like that, but now I am like this. 
I'm, I'm being changed by the power of the gospel. As, as I apply God's truth to my mind, my mind's being renewed. I'm starting to think differently. And as I start to think differently, I'm, I'm now acting differently. Um, reference to Hebrews 12, throwing off the, you know, the, the, the things that hinder us, the sin that so easily entangles. There's a transformation that's taking place in my life personally. But w- when that transformation is happening at the personal individual level, it then means that it's, if, if, we, if we look at it bigger picture, it's happening on a large scale. It's happening at a level of a community. A whole community is being changed. The way, the way, the way people live, the way people engage, they, you know, it's not so much about what's in it for me. It's, well, how can we be a blessing to the community? If, if God's tribe was to shut down, if, if we said, look, you know what, this church no longer exists in Da, w- would the city of Da feel it? Or would it be like, oh, you know, there used to be a group up the hill there, they met, they sang some nice songs, sometimes not so nice, I was trying to sleep. Um, apparently they're gone now, okay. Or w- would there actually be a sense in which the city would say, you know what, that, that church, it was like salt, it was like light, it was impacting, it was transforming, it was making a difference in our city. And we want to be that church, one of those churches, because I, I, I imagine there's others that are doing that, one of those churches that is bringing that kind of transformation to lives in our city. And it starts here with us. You know, when we talk of making disciples, it starts here. When we talk of transformation, it starts here. When we talk of all these things, it's got to start with us, and then we can take it out to, to others. If we don't have this life in us, how do we share it with others? You may have heard the, uh, the analogy of... Um, when, when you're in the airplane and, and you're with a child and, and you're, they're giving you the instructions of, of, of what happens in an emergency, well, what do they say? They say you must get your own oxygen mask on first, right? Before you put it on the child. And it's the same. It's like, man, we, we need to do these things here first, get strong here, get grounded here, and then we can... We can then be a, a help. Now, we, we, we are never going to get to a place where we're, like, we're perfect. Everything is in order. Everything is in line. We're, we're still carrying brokenness. We're still dealing with stuff. We're still going through things. But in the process, we, you know, even if, even if we're walking with a limp, but man, we, we can still be used by God because the Bible says that when we are weak, God's power is made perfect. So, so we're, not, we're not asking for like, ah, you know what? You've just got to be perfect. You've got to be so together before you can do this. Absolutely not. God is in the business of, of, of taking, yeah, just taking people that you think, really? Them? Him? Her? And sometimes you might feel that way about yourself. Me? Absolutely you. Absolutely. The book of Habakkuk is this short book that is found towards the end of the Old Testament. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this book. I would say even today you can go read the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite short, and it's really punchy, and it's, it's, a, it's a great little book there. Um, and and, and it's, it's instructive when we think of this idea of, of vision. Habakkuk complained to God about the wickedness that was taking place among God's people. There was violence, there was destruction, there was iniquity, you know, these acts that were causing pain and 
damage and loss. There was perversion of justice. And, and, and according to Habakkuk, God seemed to be looking on and doing nothing about it. So Habakkuk complains and says, God, what, what, what's going on? And, and God responds. Now, God's response is interesting because at, at the one level, God responds by saying, I will deal with it. I will deal with the wickedness that you see. That's the kind of thing you'd expect God to say because God is just. God deals with wickedness. He deals with these things. He, he, he does. But the, the part of God's response that got Habakkuk off God was when God said, I'm going to use the Chaldeans. I'm going to use the Babylonians to be the ones that are going to discipline, that are going to punish my people. And Habakkuk finds this interesting because the Babylonians were wicked. I mean, he's saying, God, your people are wicked, but you want to use a more wicked people to punish us? And, 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 and Habakkuk is struggling with this idea of God using the Babylonians, God using the Chaldeans to carry out his punishment, his justice on, on his people. And as this conversation is happening, God responds to Habakkuk. And this is part of what God says in his response. Habakkuk chapter 2, from verse 2. It says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets, so he who so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And the vision is what Habakkuk recorded in the rest of this chapter. It speaks of how God will eventually also punish the Babylonians. So it's not going to end with God's people being punished. It's, it's also going to get to a place where this wicked people will also experience the weight of God's punishment as well. And this vision comes in the context of wickedness. It comes in the context of a world that is messed up. And likewise, friends, our vision as a church to make disciples, to plant churches, to strengthen churches, to be agents of transformation, uh, this vision has been received, has been given to us by God in the context of a broken world. This world we live in is broken. It is upside down. There is violence. There is destruction. There is iniquity. There is the perversion of justice. These things are happening. And, and as you are starting 2020, you're, you're, you're possibly thinking of, of some area of your life where you think that's broken. That's not working. That's not moving the way it should. That's life. That's the world we live in. We are here because the world is broken. We are here because the world is upside down. We're here as agents of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God which is righteousness and peace and joy. We're here as, as the proclaimers of good news to the poor. We're here as agents of the kingdom 
We are the ones that have been given the keys to unlock God's kingdom, the rule and reign of God. It happens through us, the church. We are the agent. That's why we're here. So vision comes in the context of darkness. It comes to dispel, to push back darkness, dear friends. Amen. There's four observations that I'd like to draw out of this vision that Habakkuk was told to write that we can apply to ourselves as a church. The first observation is this. The vision was to be written and made plain. The vision was to be written and made plain. Putting things in writing makes them clearer. When something is in writing, it's like there it is, we can see it, and we can use language that people understand, and we don't have to rely on Sheshi's memory or someone else's memory to say, hey, what's that thing that we're supposed to do? Remember that conversation we had a few weeks ago? Can you just remind me? I, I can't. I've forgotten. But friends, if, if we actually say it's written, there it is. It's plain. And because it's written, everyone can read it. Everyone can see it. It's there. That's really helpful. And that's unifying. That brings us together. So the first thing is it's written. It's plain. It's easy to understand. It's well communicated. So we need to move in that direction and say, hey, how can we as a church make sure our vision, it's written and it's made plain. Secondly, this vision was to be read and run with. Having a vision written is a great start, but but we have to go beyond that. We actually need to read it and run with it. I've read it. Okay, there it is. I, I have read it. It's something I understand. I've internalized it. It's become part of me. And then now we need to run with it. This, this picture of, of someone running with the vision is like they, they, they've got this vision as part of them and now they're spreading it. It's like, okay, I've got the vision. Well, now I want to spread it out. I want to make sure someone else catches this vision bug. It's the kind of bug that's not good to keep to you. You know, most bugs you want to keep to yourself. This vision bug you want to spread. You want it to go viral. Come on, let's get it out there. We want to make disciples. Yes. Disciples. We want to plant churches. Yes. Let, let's, let's, let's get that out there. We want to be strengthening churches. Absolutely. We want to be agents of change, agents of transformation. Absolutely. Get the vision out there. Run with it. Running with the vision, uh, it speaks of taking responsibility. It's like, you know what, it's, it's not just the vision of the eldership team. It's not just the elders' vision. It's not just the vision of the leaders. This is our vision. Everyone's running with it. It's like you run, and you run, and you run. We're all running with the vision. And actually, for many of us at God's tribe, that's what's happening. You guys are running with this vision. You're making it happen. In some way, in some significant way, whether it's, it's a more public way or a behind-the-scenes way, but many of us are actually running with this vision. That's amazing. Thank you. I, I want to encourage you, if, if you are already someone who has said, look, I, 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 I've been brought into this vision. And I'm running with it. I want to say, keep running with it in 2020. 
And may you run with even greater clarity and, and just focus, determination, the power of the Spirit. And then there, there might be some of us who, well, you know, God's tribe, it's, it's more a Sunday thing. You know, you come, you, you're here on Sunday, you, we worship together, uh, kids are in Sunday school, um, and then yeah, you go home, and that's okay. But you, you're not really running with this vision. You come to this church, but you haven't really made this your church in taking on the vision and running with it. You're, you're not sold out yet to saying, I'm going to help this church make disciples. I'm going to help this church plant churches. I'm going to get involved and serve in an area and help this community become all that God has called it to be. I, I, I want to say in 2020, if that's you, cross that line from being involved to being committed. We need your commitment. Third observation, it's fulfillment. The fulfillment of the vision may appear slow. If it seems slow, wait for it, God says to Habakkuk. God gives a vision and it doesn't usually happen as quickly as we think it will. We see this even in the Bible. There's a few exceptions like Nehemiah. I mean, he's told to build a wall and in 52 days, whoop, the wall's up. Like, wow, that's incredible. But for, for many of the biblical characters, the vision comes and then it's like, Lord, did you really say that? I mean, Abraham is told about having this child of promise, Isaac, and it takes, takes a long time before it happens. Joseph gets this vision of, of, of greatness and it's years and, and suffering and difficulty before it actually happens. David, he's anointed as king and like, wow, I'm going to be the next king. What a vision. And then the next thing, he's being hunted down like an animal by Saul. And it takes, it takes time for, it takes time when God gives vision, it takes time. It's, it's, it's not an overnight thing. And, 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 and God is saying here, guys, its fulfillment may appear slow. But wait, wait for it. Now, waiting doesn't mean I'm going to sit down, fold my arms, and do nothing. Okay, God, you said I should wait. All right. Pass me a newspaper. I'm going to just read the paper while I wait for God to do his thing. Oh, what's on DSTV today? Yeah, okay, I'll just do that. God is going to fulfill in his time. No, waiting is still a proactive thing in the kingdom of God. Waiting means we're still getting on with it. I'm still doing my part. I'm still playing my role. I'm not just going to wait and say, okay, you know what? Let go and let God. It's, no, it's not let go and let God. It's like, what can I do? That, that Jeremiah verse that Sode made reference to, that verse, actually, it's, it's, it's connected to what we're reading this morning because when God says He's going to bring the Babylonians to destroy, which He did, and part of that was the Israelites were, were carried away, when that verse in Jeremiah comes, these guys are, they're, they're in captivity. Seventy years of captivity. And during those 70 years of captivity, 
God didn't say to them, guys, just do nothing. He says to them, guys, get involved. Build houses. Marry. Give your kids into marriage. Seek the prosperity of that place. Because if, if, if that place prospers, you too will prosper. So, so waiting on the Lord, as they were waiting on the Lord to, 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 to bring them out, they're, they're still called to be faithful, still called to work, still called to use what God has given them and to pursue His purposes. As, I, as I've thought of, of, of our church, I'll admit to you that according to my skewed estimation, my tainted estimation, progress has been slower than it should have been. I thought by now there would be more people being saved through God's tribe, more people being baptized, more churches planted, more elders appointed. We, we've, we've appointed elders uh, through the years and, you know, some have left. We thought some would be appointed as elders and they've left <laughs> as we were. It's like, I, I, honestly, I thought we would be somewhere further down the line. I thought we would have more married couples, more Tanzanian married couples. So I'm excited. I mean, we're, we're going to produce them from within, like, you know, Josiah and Maria. And I think there's others in the pipeline. But, but I, I thought there would be more couples like that that we would have reached because there's so much Brokenness, that's an area of darkness and brokenness in our city. And, and I, honestly, I have been disappointed at times at the slowness of the progress. So I'm grateful for God's word here where he says, wait. If it seems slow, wait. So we need patience. From the vision being given to the vision being realized, one of the things that builds a bridge is patience. Here is the vision. Here is the realization. We need waiting in between. It may seem slow. And then finally, this incredible promise, it will surely come. It will not delay. God says, although it has been slow, although it seems like is anything happening, it will surely come. What God has promised, God will do because God is not a man that he can lie. That would be contrary to his character. If God has said, I will do this in your life, I am going to do this through you, it will happen. God will do it. And sure enough, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they were destroyed. And another empire rose in its place. And yes, the, 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 the people of God were, were returned to their homeland. God does fulfill what He says He will fulfill. It will surely come. And are we ready to believe the promises of God? Are we ready to say, if God has said it will happen, it will surely come, then my place is to believe and to wait and to work for my part, do my part in seeing it coming. 
we hope to see more of God in our lives. But the, the truth is, dear friends, even as we look at that vision statement that God has given us as a church, already it has come. Already there are things in that statement we can look at and say, man, God is doing that. Disciples are being made. Lives are being changed. Churches are, have been planted. We've maybe not done a whole lot, but we've certainly been part of it in some way. God is already fulfilling that vision. It will surely come. And in 2020, we need to get to a place where we're saying, God, help us to have more clarity, to have more focus on what you are doing, to trust you more, that this will be a year where vision will be fuel in our hearts. Vision will be a fire to this church. Vision will so captivate us. And we are going to do all that we can in the power of the Holy Spirit to play our part in the fulfillment of the vision that you have given us. I want to end by just making a little bit more reference to that Habakkuk verse. Because when Christine was speaking earlier on, she spoke about faith. And she spoke about faith that we see in, you know, those heroes of the faith in, in Hebrews. And that Habakkuk verse, I hadn't prepared this part of it, but this morning I was like, am I missing out on an opportunity to encourage us in the area of faith? And when Christine spoke, I just thought, absolutely. So it goes on in verse 4 to say this. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. The righteous will live by his faith. And this idea of righteous people living by faith is, it's, it's at the foundation of, of, our, of who we are as Christians. That our lives are lives of faith. We, we are made right with God because we have faith in Jesus Christ. And then everything that we do, we, we, we don't live by the circumstances that we see, but we live because we trust in God who is above the circumstances. And the writer of Hebrews uh, that we heard from earlier on makes reference to this Habakkuk verse. It says here in Hebrews 10, He who is coming will come. And will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. So friends, he's coming. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for us. Let's live Let's live by faith. Amen. Trudy and Angie, they had some prophetic words that they would like to share with us as a church. So ladies, please do go ahead. Do you want to, yeah, you can, you can come up. Um, that, that's great. Good morning. It's so good to be together with you guys. We've missed you over the break. Our family got to travel to Nairobi over the Christmas break. Um, it was really nice. We stayed with the Massingham family, the family that um, Sheshi made reference to here this morning that helped start God's tribe. And that was just a nice time for us to be with them, enjoy friendship uh, with them. Uh, and it was just as a little testimony from Belinda's side. She's become a, a close friend. And Belinda is the one who got the Little Spark Sunday School started here at God's Tribe. And um, Trudy started Blaze. 
And that was when we were at Azura Gym. And I was able to share with Belinda how big our Sunday school is and how it's grown and how the Edwards are leading that charge and other teachers have stepped up. And it was a real encouragement to her because um, Sheshi said, God uses anybody. And Belinda very much often has felt like an anybody. Um, her husband is a businessman. That's his main um, call in his life. And he leverages his business and his calling as a marketplace Christian to further the kingdom of God. And that's what the Massinghams have done. In faith, moved to Dar Salaam so that Calvin could work in business. He actually had a connection with Sarah Majengo. Sarah, he did ask about you and your family. Um, and helped in, in the extra time, not that there's always a lot of extra time when you have a family, you're in a new city, you're starting a business, they decided to help um, plant this church and God uses anybody and he is faithful um, and so it was so nice to be able to encourage Belinda and she was like oh Angie you don't know how many days I spent on my knees praying for that little Sunday school program because I felt so out of my element she had never led a Sunday school program before they came from an established church in South Africa, but God uses it, and he's faithful, and they did their part to contribute to the vision of this church, and they didn't get, she didn't get to see the fullness of it, did she? She gets to hear about it now, so I want to encourage us, even on the back of that word that Sheshi just shared, that we are a people of an eternal kingdom, with an eternal perspective. So we do our part in the leg of our journey here towards that vision, but we trust him to bring the fullness of it. And we might not see it till we get to heaven, right? We might not get to see the full capacity of that, but let's be faithful in that. And the other part that I'm, Trudy just asked me to share this morning that's going to tie with what she's sharing is, Guys, we are part of this global move of the Church of Jesus at work. So when we go to Nairobi, if you visit One Tribe Church, our sister church, and you say, hey, I'm part of God's tribe, they're going to love on you. You're like family there. It was really cool. We didn't know Mark Dunker was there hanging out with the Grover family. The Grovers are part of that church now. Um, also Charles, is it Big Charles? He had shared his testimony here before he left. He's going there while he's um, starting his new job in Nairobi. So if you go to Nairobi, go visit them. They'll welcome you. Um, but what they did was call up our family and said, you know what, we want to pray for you guys on behalf of God's tribe church. We want to lay hands on you, come around you, and pray for some key points for this church. They love us, guys. They're praying for us. They're for us. Um, and then later on, afterwards, one of the women in the church had come to uh, Pastor Mbonisi and shared a picture, and I don't, I think we have it. It's a picture of like a pyramid of people. And I want to, I think sometimes people get a little panicked when we say prophetic words and sharing a picture. Okay, we're not replacing scripture. Scripture is God's full word. But the Holy Spirit is here in our lives. And he is a person, the third person of the Trinity. He is our comforter. He is our counselor. He is very personal. And sometimes, out of the goodness of his love for us, he gives us something personal that encourages us, that builds us up. That's what that's for. It's not to replace scripture. It's to build us up and strengthen us. So this is the picture that was shared. And what she said, I'm just going to find my picture here, is this is what it read. Um, this lady said, while praying for the pickles at church, the word community was strongly on my heart for God's tribe church. 
and I saw a human-like pyramid starting to build, like it was starting with two people, then more came around and lifted the first people, and eventually there was a strong and sturdy group, and then that was the picture that she shared. Um, and I just thought that was a really encouraging visual for us. And we can pray into what does that actually mean. Um, but I think I can take encouragement from that, that sometimes I feel like my little part isn't doing much. But if I do my little part, invest in one, invest in two, and then they invest in more, God is building his church and then Trudy wanted to share just something that God put on her heart. So at the beginning of the year, I always, always ask God, what are you saying to our church? It's just my habit that as I pray for the church, I just want God to say something. And the truth is God is always speaking. And for me, like Angie says, God always speaks to me in pictures. So as I was praying for us as a church, I didn't even know what she was going to preach about. To be honest, he doesn't even share with me what he's preaching on. He says to me, you're going to hear it in church like everybody else. So as I was praying, um, I saw a picture of people. So the people, obviously, is this church. It's us. But we were in a field. So in a planting field, like we're planting. But we were shoulder to shoulder. So if you imagine us walking in a field, but shoulder to shoulder with hoes digging, and actually moving forward. So when you think about farmers, subsistence farmers, they dig one person at a time, then they take a break. But we were digging in rows of people moving, and I just asked the Holy Spirit, I just sat on it for a few days, and I asked the Holy Spirit, what does that picture mean? And the two things that came to me were, um, God is calling us to hard work. In this year, he wants us to work hard as a church. So not just work hard here in church, but work hard in all aspects. So if you think about what Sheshi preached, I just thought, wow, this picture is actually what Sheshi is preaching on, that God wants us to work hard, not just here at church, but in all aspects of our lives. God is not, he's not like a, a God who says, oh, you just look smart and clean on Sundays. Like that's just not God. He wants us to be transformed all of our lives. So when you're at home or you're nursing a baby, he wants us to be hardworking believers. That's what he wants. And that's what he's calling us in 2020 as a church to be hardworking. I also, the other word that I felt was growth. So when you think of people who are planting together, something is going to grow because people plant and they believe in faith, right? There's no farmer who just digs and goes off and thinks nothing's going to happen. There's no farmer like that. And so as we plant or as we move together, I actually felt this word that he brought on faith, that God is saying things are going to grow in faith. So things that we're going to plant, we have to believe that rain will come, God will water, and stuff will come out. So whatever that area of growth, it could be something physical, something spiritual, something emotional, or maybe at work, whatever area, you will see what this word means for you as an individual I just think it's a word for us as a church that we need to actually dwell on it and think about it. How am I going to plant together with my family here and how am I going to grow together and really trust God for faith for that. So the scripture that um, I always, when God gives me a picture, I always actually ask him for a scripture because some people struggle when, when you share a picture, they're like, well, where is that in the Bible? That's from your own head. Um, but I just kept, this scripture kept coming to me Enlarge the place, it's in Isaiah 54. Enlarge the place of your t tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and the left. Your descendants will dispose nations and settle in their desolate cities. And I just felt if we are planting together, God is actually going to stretch us and lengthen us as we do this together. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really encouraging. And the print on that Bible is so small. You must have 2020 vision. Um, so let's 
Let's take a few minutes to pray together. Um, if I can ask us to stand and in groups of three or four, let's pray for just a couple of minutes into what we have uh, shared this morning, um, this picture of community being built, of uh, working hard together um, into our vision statement, the different things we've heard today, uh, this Habakkuk passage, uh, if we can spend some minutes praying and, and then I'll call us back so that we can share in the Lord's uh, Supper together. So let's do that. Okay. Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for allowing us to see this new year, 2020. Help us to live this year with a real sense of purpose, with a clear and compelling vision before us. Help us, Lord, to not pursue our own agendas, but to align ourselves with what you want to do. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in us, to be at work in this community. Uh, we pray that you would uh, give us strength to work hard together to build a community that honors you, to make disciples, to share the gospel, and to glorify your name in every area of life. Thank you, Lord, that we are the agents of transformation for the city of Da and beyond. And we pray that this year we would move forward in your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 